All right, everyone. Uh, we'll get started as people join us from uh, after lunch. I don't know whether it's worse to be before lunch or after lunch, or during lunch, I guess is the worst. My name is David Monsma. I am the executive director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. Uh, as I was just explaining to Mira, we have about 30 policy programs, so I'm one of, of, of those 30 directors. Um, but I also help convene and co-direct with uh, three other policy programs at the Institute, uh, a Aspen strategy group on food security. And so I'm delighted uh, here really just to act as a moderator uh, for an illustrious panel that we have today uh, to talk about the importance of food security and population. And so I, we'll just get started. I think we're just going to... Uh, uh, present from our seats here at the panel, uh, and I, I think everyone here at this at this venue understands that there are some contextual forces that we're all thinking about and, and concerned about. Uh, one of them is a growing population um, between now and 2050, possibly adding another 2 billion people to the world's population. Uh, the other is climate change, um, and, uh, and there are many others, but within that context, uh, and the, uh, of the demographic change and climate change, uh, there is then the question about our world food system and all the dynamics that fit within it in terms of uh, nutrition, uh, reproductive rights, uh, food security, and other aspects. Uh, from our food security strategy group at Aspen, our perspective, what I've found interesting is that we do think food security is the framework, or AA framework, or paradigm by which climate security water security, uh, climate change, or uh, uh, human security, and uh, the different uh, needs that are going to be met over the next 20 years for sustainable development actually work best under in a food security paradigm. And so that's a perspective that we're pursuing with a group of about 45 experts in our strategy group, and two of those people are here on the panel today. Um, well, let me start by introducing, I'm not going to give you their biographies because you have them uh, on the paper that was on your seat, but uh, well, beginning on the end, I'll just quickly go through and introduce and then return to Jason to start us off. Uh, Jason Clay is, our se is the Senior Vice President for Market Transformation at the World Wildlife Fund. I think you've noticed his name. He's a part of our food security strategy group and uh, brings uh, an important perspective on climate change and food uh, security that uh, is sometimes missing in that dialogue. Uh, Clive Mutunga, uh, I got these uh, backwards now, so <laughs> I don't know what happened to the, the name tense there, um, is, uh, I guess I should say, Salif Nyang is the co-founder and chief impact officer for Malo. He's to Jason's right. Uh, and uh, Salif joined us in Rome for the first food security strategy group meeting to bring a perspective on, on technology and things that are happening and he's doing in Mali. Uh, Clive Matunga is from, uh, to his right, is uh, from the family planning, he is the family planning and environment technical advisor at USAID uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he's informed me that he is the PHE man. I, I guess this is a new acronym for population health and environment. Is that, is that right? Uh, and then to his right is the Honorable uh, Joy Palumbi. She is the chair and the co-sponsor uh, of this panel today uh, with the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health. And she's also the executive secretary for African Leaders for Malaria, the Malaria, Malaria Alliance. Uh, to her right is Mira Shekhar, to my left, and she is the lead health and nutrition specialist at uh, the African Human Development uh, at the World Bank. And now, if we could, I think I'll ask Jason uh, to begin us off. We're going to do a, a series of very short introductions, start a conversation. Aspen likes dialogue, so we'll invite you at the end to be a part of that discussion. So, at least for, at least for me, uh, food security falls into... Uh, a couple of issues. One is availability. Is there enough food? And the other is access and affordability. Do people actually have the ability to buy the food they need, et cetera, uh, or produce it? Let me give just a little bit of a backdrop since nobody else has done it. There's 800 plus million who are malnourished. There's about 1.3, 1.4 million who are overnourished. Most of the malnourished today live in rural areas. By 2050, most will probably live in urban areas. Uh, but today, half of all the farmers on the planet can't feed their own families. So this is one of the things that we have to deal with in this particular discussion. By 2050, 25 to 30 percent population increase, 190 percent increase in per capita income, if the projections are, are accurate, about 100 percent per capita increases in consumption, and about 70 percent of all the people will live in cities. 
that's as many as are alive today. So those are some of the big, big uh, backdrops. What that all means is that by 2050, in the next 40 years or so, we have to produce as much food as we have in the last 8,000 8, years to provide everybody with adequate food. Uh, what I think that means is that we need to double net food availability without using more land or water. And the reason I say it that way is that we have to focus on productivity and efficiency, but we've also got to focus on waste and consumption, and we've got to look at trade as a way to move food from places that it's easier to produce it to places where we're short of it. Trade's going to play a key role. Comparative advantage is real, and global trade in food has been picking up a lot. In the last 10, 15 years, since 2000, uh, the amount of food traded has gone from 6% of calories produced to 12 to 15%. So it's more than doubled in just, in just over a decade. Um, eight countries, we're becoming more dependent on a few places to produce the food that fills the gaps every year. Eight countries for the last 10 years produced about 65% of the cereal grain exports and about 85% of the oil seed exports. Uh, in 2012, four of those eight countries had drought. And that's how fragile, in some ways, the food system is today. Uh, in, in 2010, Russia closed its borders to wheat exports. Uh, and within three months, a person set themselves on fire in Tunisia. We had dock workers' strikes uh, in Egypt over, over food prices, middle-class strikes in Algeria over food prices. And pretty soon, we had the Arabs, what has become known as the Arab Spring. One of the things that's curious, though, is that trade of food is subject to, to the highest tariffs and trade barriers of any product category today. And so that is actually acting against our ability to move food around just when we need to be able to do it more. There is a, a big issue of food price rises and conflicts. Uh, the Chicago Council came out with a report last month that shows a direct correlation between food riots and the 2007-8 price spikes and the 2010-2011 price spikes. It's an it's a incredible correlation. I would say you should go look at it. We're not using slides or I would have shown it because it's just an amazing uh, correlation between the two. 2012, we had four of the eight exporters with drought. This year, the US is in a profound drought. 40% of California is not going to be planted of, of its ag land. Uh, the western states, including all the way into the wheat and corn producing areas, are suffering from drought. And what we're finding from the 2012 experience is that it takes two years of average rainfalls to recover from one of these droughts. But we've had two years of drought in a row in some of these areas, and we're going on to the third. And so that's going to make it much harder for these soils to recover. When you have two to three years of drought, you have a 10-year recovery process, and that influences production forever. And you start volatilizing the organic matter in those soils, which also reduces your ability to produce. So this year, we also have a little thing called the Ukrainian conflict. What percentage of Ukraine's crop is going to be planted? Ukraine is one of those eight countries that supplies surpluses to the world. So these are things that are, that are happening now. Just to kind of conclude, I think we haven't even begun to see what the impacts of climate change are going to be on productivity and on, on food prices uh, and on variability. Weather variability, we know. It's kind of the new euphemism for how we talk about climate change. Uh, extreme weather is another one of those things. And it's not just about food crops. Food security is also about being able to afford to buy food. And that means selling crops like cocoa and coffee and tea and palm oil to others and then being able to buy uh, your own food. What all this, we, we see that if you look at the, the projections, Mexico will not be a coffee producer by 2030. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire will have about 10% of the land currently in cocoa that will be able to produce cocoa using current genetic varieties and under current conditions. Only about 10% of that land is going to be producing cocoa. They, they produce 70% of the world's cocoa today. So the response times to climate change are going to have to be very fast. Better practices will get us through five or 10 years. At that point, you're going to have to switch crops and switch geographies and what farmers and what governments are actually prepared to do that. Thank you. Jason, could you just uh, return to the beginning of your comments and, and remind us, what's your definition of food security? 
having enough food and the ability to access it for all. We'll turn to you, Salib. Thank you. Um, so for, over the last couple of years, um, I've been in Mali kind of looking at the issue of food security from an entrepreneurial standpoint, even though my background is in academia and looking at the implications of population change on security, conflict, and, um, and governance. And so some of the, the things that we have been kind of crystallizing, uh, the linkages between food security, resiliency, and populations that the solutions kind of need to be multidimensional. <coughs> so oftentimes we focus on the issue of seeds or types of seeds or new types of seed, uh, new types of uh, varieties that are resistant to drought, uh, resist to climate change, and that absolutely is necessary. That's that's absolutely necessary. But it's not sufficient. One of the major uh, obstacles as well uh, when it comes to food security is that it's not just sufficient for people to eat. It's essential for them to have the nutrients that they need to thrive. And for that reason, the types of diets people are consuming today, the types of crops they're growing, the types of crops that are quote unquote popular uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be emphasized. And the third one is uh, the environmental issue. These crops need to um, be environmental, environmentally sustainable. So three things I think that could uh, improve this or potential that we have is one is obviously technology innovation. Uh, there's a lot of work happening right now around using solar power drip irrigation to drastically reduce the use of water, to re reduce the amount of fertilizer that's being used. So Jason talked about the importance of soil and uh, Howard Buffett, who's I guess the world's most famous farmer, one of the most, world's most famous farmers, uh, his big mantra is like it's all about the dirt. You know, when he sees the farmer travel somewhere, the first thing he does is gets on his knees and sees the quality of the soil and the nutrient matter of it. So there's definitely a lot of uh, improvement we can do just at the micro level without spending a lot of money just by disseminating the knowledge that's out there using innovative tools like cell phones, uh, the internet, is, uh, that's definitely one of the trends that we're seeing for is the widespread use of uh, mobile technology to just get farmers that right now are struggling into all these different issues to adapt practices that can boost their productivity without really investing so much. And one uh, simple example is like no tillage or preventing slash and burn, which is Frankly, I think the evidence is pretty clear that that is not really the way to go if you really want to boost uh, productivity. So there's some small behavioral changes that can happen right now that can make a, a large difference. And if you multiply that by the millions of farmers uh, out there in the world today, you can, you can start to see some, see some gains. Uh, Jason talked also about markets and access. So that's definitely something that's important. I tend to think, think of it more as creating new markets. We tend to assume that these markets already exist. And for example, it's just about how do you get the small holders to the markets, how do you get them access to the markets. In most of these countries, you actually need to create new markets because the markets really are not there or they're completely dysfunctional. And the example from my background is with rice in Mali and to, to look at the kind of segment the market even further, to take local rice. For all intents and purposes, there's no local rice market in Mali. You know, farmers grow rice. If they can find a buyer at harvest, they sell. If they can't, then they're kind of they kind of screwed. Or next year, they probably have just the behavior and not plant as much. You know, they'll grow what they need to consume, and they're not really going to supply consumers in Bamako in the capital city because consumers can be fickle. So the really the only real market for rice that's really kind of being developed right now is imported rice. So you have a couple of well placed entrepreneurs that bring you know they've kind of done the research and they bring rice from Asia or elsewhere to target that market, but they're not really doing the same. That's not really happening when it comes to local rice. So that's a great opportunity right there to begin developing the demand for local rice. But that, in turn, needs to foster changes in the farmer's behavior to incentivize them to plant properly, to you know, harvest properly, obviously invest, if they can, in milling technology into packaging. And then you can start to see, some, I think, some uh, interesting progress in terms of boosting product production and bringing down the cost of food. And the third kind of thing I'll just kind of touch on um, that I think is important in this debate is the issue of uh, not just looking at population size, but also the composition of the, pop of the population. So in a few years or in a few decades, you know, we're going to hit uh, 9 billion. But more importantly, the age profile of that is going to be drastically different. It's something the world has never seen before. So right now, Mali has a population under 30. That's about 80% of the total population. What does that mean, like, practically? It means that... People are older, the median age is increasing, consumption per head is increasing. And the flip side of that is that if most of these folks 
are young, are adults, and are looking you know, for what their future is going to be, what their uh, job op opportunities are, it can also lead to potential trouble. So I see food security, or achieving food security, as an ideal vehicle to address these simultaneous issues, the issue of food and the issue of providing unemployment opportunities to the, to the millions and millions of youth, especially in the developing world, they, they're going to be looking for job opportunities and, and hope. Thank you, Salif. And uh, Jason gave us kind of a definition of, of food security I think most people share. Um, if you look at the gl current global food system in terms of a, of a market, a global market, what's the missing, what is the largest gap from your perspective? I think there's, I mean, there's increasingly more talk about nutrition, nutritional security. Um, I, th I forget the statistics, but most of the foods grown are basically grown cereal crops. I think most of most of the, the, the planet's land is devoted to, to cereals, which are cr critical because it's a big component of people's calorie intake. Uh, not so much on nutrient dense crops, not not on fruits, not of, uh, not of um, uh, emphasis on on. Um, Yes, there's a lot of emphasis on livestock, for example. That's another big issue that we grow a lot of yeah. cereal crops that actually feed animals. I think if we can think a bit more uh, holistically about nutrition writ large, not just so much on just boosting maize and some of these cereal crops, but also um, uh, whether it's uh, cover crops, which also improves the, the nutrient content and suppresses carbon, and it could also be used potentially as animal feed. I think we have a much better, I think we have a much better roadmap to achieve uh, more broad nutritional security, not just increasing the amount of like tons that we produce every year. And you called it nutritional or nutrition security. You could also call it crop diversity as a part of that. Yeah. The key component. Actually. Yeah, key component. Okay. And diet. I mean, and the flip side is diets. People need to really adjust their diets. Okay. All right. We'll turn to you now, Clive Matunga. Yeah. Let me begin by saying that um, agricultural policies, trade policies, and uh, some of the broader economic policies do have a, a big role to play uh, for food security. But uh, I want to emphasize that uh, the uh, population dynamics are also key. Uh, conceptually, there are many links between population dynamics, including family planning, reproductive health, and food security. But most of these. Well, most of these links are really mediated by, by population growth. There are some direct links, for instance, between family planning and food security. But uh, most of these other relationships are mediated by a third factor, such as women's empowerment or poverty. I wanted to also say that um, food, food availability, which is a key component of food security, is influenced by the ability of small older farmers to produce food. And in many countries, women perform the bulk of uh, the agricultural labor. For instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, more than half of the lab, agricultural labor force is provided by women. So that kind of makes them the principal agents for food production. But uh, on the flip side, these, women's, uh, these women have less land and fewer resources than their male counterparts for food production. So it's clear that uh, closing the gender gap um, in agriculture and other food security uh, sectors can improve women's access to land, agricultural inputs, and knowledge of uh, improved agricultural techniques, which has an opportunity to increase uh, yields in some cases as much as 20 to 30 percent. But uh, that's like on the production side, but also in, the, in terms of access. Women are likely to channel the income they control into the nutrition, health, and education of their children, which is, uh, which, which is a paramount uh, link. But like I mentioned, their work on farms is often unpaid and undervalued. Combined with unpaid labor at home, this equals to over sometimes a third of the world gross domestic product. So, um, women's roles like pregnancy, breastfeeding, and child care may also may limit their mobility and time that they are able to spend on learning new techniques and contributing to increased food production. Uh, family planning programs that influence women's fertility and particularly having, too, having children too early, too often, or too late can really cause high maternal mobility and low educational attainment and may limit their ability to work. But uh, Compare this to the, the fact that 222 million women across the world do not have the tools to control their family size, and met need as uh, we call it, yet we expect them to be healthier and wealthier. Uh, what, what I want you to get from my remarks is that addressing the health needs of women 
and families in the developing world and the world all over could, through increased access to family planning and reproductive health, can help uh, slow rapid population growth, improve their health and the health of their families, and enhance their food security and resilience. Well, the good news is that there is increasing recognition of the importance of integrating population dynamics, including family planning and reproductive health, and food security in a broader development science policy and programming. So I'll briefly mention the science and mention that um, there is plenty of evidence to show in the role, the important role of population dynamics and family planning in food security and building resilience. I'll mention the latest uh, report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which highlights population dynamics as the important role that family, family planning can play in reducing climate change vulnerability and uh, as a potential adaptation strategy and building resilience. In fact, in one of the chapters, the, the report acknowledges that meeting the need for family planning services in areas with both high fertility and high vulnerability to climate change, such as the Sahel region of Africa, can reduce human suffering and help people adapt to climate change. Let me also talk briefly about the policy. Um, even before the science was there, uh, national policymakers had already started making these links. For instance, in the national adaptation programs of action, which were prepared by 49 least developed countries, identify population as an important uh, factor for climate change adaptation. Some countries even propose projects that should link the adaptation actions to family planning and reproductive health. And then I'll briefly mention programming in my last one minute. While we know the intent of good policies is really to inform uh, programs and projects on the ground, that is always a big challenge because even in some of the organizations and agencies that recognize the links, for instance, USAID, um, it really needs to come up with a broad, uh, with a, a strong program and project. For, uh, I'll talk briefly about the resiliency project, resiliency initiative of uh, the United States Agency for International Development, which recognizes some of the vertical approaches and different funding uh, streams. But now that uh, the resilience program looks at the issues of agriculture, economic growth, women's empowerment, and family planning in an integrated manner aiming to get all the key stakeholders together and coordinate activities on the ground. Um, I'll also, in the, the last 30 minutes, talk about one of the programming uh, frameworks that USAID has been implementing for the last 10 years to integrate population health and environment, popularly known as PHE, population health and environment. These projects aim to simultaneously improve access to health services and manage natural resources in ways that improve livelihoods in a comprehensive and integrated strategy, building upon existing synergies between health, family planning, and the environment, because that has been proved to be more efficient than implementing separate programs to ad address the issues uh, individually. So USID has been and looks forward to partner with other stakeholders to leverage funding and uh, bring this work to scale and hopefully meet the goals of food security and poverty alleviation sustainable livelihoods uh, and resilience in a balanced, equitable, and sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. And can you just add, because I, I think that uh, what I've seen, that both the public, but also sometimes even working with stakeholder groups, that were challenged by a lot of terminology in food security or in development. Um, but what's your definition uh, for, for resilience or resiliency in the context of family planning and reproductive education or health? Resiliency is, will be defined um, as the ability of communities being able to mitigate, adapt, and bounce back uh, to their, to better or their normal situation. And so looking at the social dimension of that to make sure that uh, the needs of the communities are met in times of uh, shocks, whether economic, whether um, climate change or other related choice. And family planning is a key part of the building that resilience from your perspective. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, family planning is one of the key, uh, but yet um, unappreciated uh, link that needs to be there to really uh, build resilience because most of the efforts are really focused on the, on the demand side, but really the social dynamics of a system need to be uh, to be uh, part of an integral part of any resilience. Okay, great. 
Well, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Joy Palumbi, uh, as our kind of co-chair for this uh, for this presentation and panel. And I know you've thought a lot about all of the three topics that have just been presented. Thank you very much, and I, I want to thank um, my colleague here because he has covered a lot of um, the, the issues that we normally uh, address in the Global Leaders Council um, on, on reproductive health. I think just going back to the basics, uh, a, a young mother um, uh, or a young potential mother, um, in order to be able to um, have children that, sh that she can grow into uh, contributing members of the of the of the society who are going to in, you know contribute to GDP in the country it, as well as creating their own wealth has first of all to ensure that she delays pregnancy and only starts having these children when she 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 is in a position that she can afford to to educate them and to feed them properly and to bring them up well and have that process not interfere with her own ability to sustain her family. That, that family of, of children. So first of all, she has to delay that pregnancy. And then the next thing is that when, once she has that, starts having children at the right time, she must have the right number of children that will enable her to sustain them in the manner that I talked about without endangering her own ability uh, to, uh, to do so. And then, um, and then now how do we get this woman to be in that position? Uh, I think panelists here have spoken about the the issue of access, but there's also the issue of uh, and the issue the relevance of skills development of education, and the the, the importance of access to means of production, and and uh, and uh, the importance of the market. You know how 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 uh, has the market been uh, shaped? in order to enable her when she produces goods as a, first, as a, as a small farmer, if that is her main uh, source of livelihood, uh, to be able to sell her products uh, to Kenya and to uh, Europe and to the U.S. and not have to, to worry that uh, there are only eight countries globally that have got the responsibility of feeding the world and she can participate in this very, very uh, uh, protected uh, uh, market space. So, so that is really the, the 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 challenge that is facing us, and that is where the resiliency comes in. The resiliency comes in when you have a critical mass of these women who are able to be in a position to make these informed decisions, to have this access both to uh, to, to to family planning communities and the means of production, and to markets and the education and skills development that they require. That is how you build res res resiliency. Because once a woman has that, she's going to ensure that she passes it on to her children. And she's not going to pass it on to, t to 10 children or to, f or to 8 children or to 6 children, but she's going to ch pass it on to 2 or 3 children that she can afford to, to, to maintain. And so that critical link between that resilience in, uh, in participation in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in the market and in, in the in gross domestic product in the country is 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 very very linked to food security and food production because primarily because the continent where i where, that i come from africa for example has identified agriculture as very very pivotal to development of the african continent and as a major uh, a, a employer and creator of a, of a, of a, of wealth for, for, for the economy. Now, how are we going to do this uh, if we do not address these critical uh, access issues that, that, I, that, that I talked about? I think the important thing for us uh, in Africa is that um, our common agreement on the post-2015 agenda is, uh, is uh, centered along four critical areas. First is structural economic transformation and inclusive growth, growth which includes the sustainable growth, agricultural uh, food uh, security and nutrition, as well as green growth, and, and all these areas that uh, my colleagues here uh, just talked about. But a second important uh, 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 aspect of our, of our common agreement for the agenda is the human capital development that not only focuses on how we address extreme poverty, but also it focuses on the universal access to, uh, to quality health care, gender equality, women's empowerment, population and youth dynamics, particularly that the, we have um, the medium age in sub-Saharan Africa under now is under the age of uh, 18 years of age. So there's a huge opportunity for us 
for a huge demographic dividend. But we know that this dividend is only going to occur when access to reproductive health services uh, uh, that meets uh, the unmet need that uh, my colleague talked about uh, amongst youth and population uh, allows us to, to have a, a, a population growth that, is, that, 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 that uh, allows a larger working uh, age population uh, than the, the, the school age population, that is the dependent population. Uh, that is going to give us first the first demographic, the first demographic uh, uh, dividend uh, or demographic transition, and also the second dividend, which operates when there is accumulated wealth, because now you have you know uh, less children, you are able to accumulate more wealth. Those children are also able to accumulate more wealth, and you have greater investments in human capital. So my opinion is that there is no aspect of human development that is not relevant to population and food security and that human development is key to building sustainable systems so that is where the resilience comes in and the sustainability comes in with the focus on human development and human development that addresses the needs that enables you to be an active member of the of of, of the society and to contribute to gross uh, domestic product thank you Joy, you talked about the, the critical mass of women in this position. That is the access question of both the means of production, access to markets, and family planning and reproductive health services. Um, what is an example that you see optimism for? Where where is that going to work, or where is it working now? Where those where that set or critical mass of women is about to occur or could occur? Okay, uh, without sounding like a broken record. Um, I, I, I will use um, Rwanda as an example. Um, if you look at who is driving uh, the economic growth and development in Rwanda in the rural communities at the, at the moment, it's women. And they are in the agricultural sector. You know, uh, for example, that Rwanda produces a, a, a lot of the coffee that we are drinking this morning at Starbucks, those of us who are fans of Starbucks. And, 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 and this is the access to the markets and the market shaping that we are talking about. Uh, similar things are happening in Kenya, where uh, women are producing uh, flowers that are being uh, sold, you know, on uh, on Valentine's Day in Europe. You know, roses that have been sold in Valentine's Day in Europe. So, so, so this is the the market shaping, and this is the example that it can happen, but it needs to happen as well in food production and food security issues, and be able to address the current conundrum that is facing us, where as people transition from extreme poverty into uh, the next tier, um, they, they, they find that they can only afford the staples or the, the cereals. And these are the, 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 the food that are now contributing to the, uh, the, the, the global uh, um, obesity epidemic because they are the cheapest. So it is expensive to be healthy. So how do we break that with the market shaping exercise? All right, great. Thank you very much. I will turn to you now, Mira Shekhar. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so I think uh, my fellow panelists have already made um, a lot of uh, really, really important points. I'm just going to pick up on a, on a few key issues. First, to, uh, to say that from the bank, the World Bank's perspective, I, I'm not going to repeat the focus on, on the new twin goals of the World Bank from reducing poverty to um, uh, focusing on shared prosperity. I'm, I'm assuming that you've heard a lot about that in the last few days. So I won't repeat that again. But simply to mention that thinking about that as the end point, um, resilience, building resilience is absolutely critical to achieving those goals, whether it is resilience to climate change or resilience to economic shocks or resilience to any other kinds of shocks that might uh, come away. The, uh, the unfortunate things about shocks are um, they're usually unpredictable. We never knew when, uh, when they're going to happen. So building resilience in advance is, is the way to, to mitigate this thing. Climate change is a shock that we think is, we know a little bit more about what, what to expect. But there are many other shocks potentially lurking in the background. So, so really, focusing on building resilience is absolutely critical to trying to uh, address these issues. Um, 
I won't focus too much on food security because that's been talked about quite a bit. But the issue that um, I think Salif, uh, yeah, you mentioned and, and several other panelists have mentioned as well, is the links between food security and nutrition. So let me focus a little bit on that to begin with. And I'm going to say a few things to provoke some questions so that anybody who's hoping to sleep in the back row will hopefully wake up. Um, Human capital. When we think about hu building human capital, you want to start, um, as, as Joy was saying, with the mother and the young child. A child, from a, from a nutrition and from a human capital point of view, the window of opportunity that you have to e either make or break a whole generation, human capital of a whole generation, is from pre-pregnancy until the first two years of life. That's what we call uh, the thousand days uh, in a child's life. And actually, one of the most articulate people on the, on the thousand days, days has been um, the um, uh, secretary, uh, ex-secretary of state, Hillary Clinton. And she really got, got it, and she really pushed the agenda very in a, in a really uh, aggressive and articulate manner. If you can invest in children at that time, from pre-pregnancy to two years of age, you can lock in human capital for life. And that's, a, that's an amazing fact that's been shown. Children who've been through early childhood nutrition programs in Guatemala 30 plus years ago, the boys today are earning 46% more than kids who did not go through those things. So talk about something like that. On the other hand, we also have a lot of evidence that if you try to intervene with food, act more food after the age of two, you, you will get these children to uh, grow in this direction. You will not help them grow in this direction. You can't improve cognitive function. You cannot improve human capital. You cannot get these kids to grow taller. You will have, um, unfortunately, short, fat kids. And that's something that is contributing to the global epidemic of overweight, obesity, uh, cardiovascular diseases, and all the healthcare costs that come with those. So I'm not going to uh, uh, go too much into detail on that. But really, I want to make this point that if you want to invest in human capital, building resiliency, building the um, capacity of countries to, um, uh, to take part in the demographic dividend that several colleagues have talked about, then you need to invest at that time. You lock in human capital or you lose it for life. And it's, it's a permanent thing. Um, in order to be able to do that, you need to focus on th uh, have access to three things, food, health, and care. You've heard a lot about food. Uh, I won't go into detail on health, but I do want to focus a little bit on care because it links very closely to, to the women's agenda. Women are the key caretakers in, in households. So how do we focus on enhancing women's ability to, uh, to be able to take care of their children? How do we give them the time that, that is necessary to be able to do that? How do we empower them? We haven't talked a lot, and there isn't too much time, but maybe later, about adolescent girls. And, and not just spacing pregnancy, but delaying pregnancy so that it doesn't happen during adolescence, because that will impact on young children, but it also impacts on, on women themselves. Last, um, last comment to say that food security, as, as we've been discussing it, is necessary but not sufficient to improve human capital. And, and I want to say that, really. Think about a country like, like India, for example. Green Revolution, huge amounts of food security at the national level, at an aggregate level. But if you look at India, India has the largest percentage of, of stunted children in the world. It, it doesn't add up. It's because the Green Revolution focused so much on cereals and aggregate food security, um, did not pay attention to issues of climate, did not necessarily pay uh, attention to issues of of the nutrient content of these crops. So now the conversation is starting to happen about how can we do more nutrition-sensitive agriculture. So let me stop there and 
Oh, do you? Yeah. Mira, say a little bit more, though, if you will, about the links between nutrition and food security. I like that you've noticed that uh, food security is necessary but insufficient. And um, But I, I think that you've, you've kind of shown that there's a window, the first thousand days. Uh, is that more a question of accessibility or affordability? Is it more a question of resilience or access to reproductive health services? Um, so that's a question that would take several PhD theses to, <laughs> to answer. Go, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the links between food security and and nutrition. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, as several colleagues have said, you can focus on aggregate food production. That doesn't necessarily suffice. Um, at first, because the um, access is not available to the poorest, not necessarily available to the poorest. So there's a whole lot of things that need to be done to ensure access for the poor. But even when there's access for the poor, intra-household food allocation is absolutely critical. In most societies, whether in Africa or in South Asia, um, it's the head of the household who gets access to food first because he is seen as, as the breadwinner. But in fact, as, as Joy has been saying, it's the women that actually carry the maximum workload in the household. So, so that's one whole area. The other um, I issue is around dietary diversity. Agricultural systems in general have not focused on that. And perhaps another related thing is, is as we think about nutrition-sensitive agriculture, I want to think about some of the positive things we could do uh, as well through those um, the new opportunities that we have. The dialogue has opened up today. It wasn't the case three years ago or even uh, two years ago, but today it really is open. Um, can we, through our agriculture projects, can we um, support technologies that reduce women's workloads that will really help in terms of uh, improving nutrition outcomes. Um, can we use our agriculture extension workers not just to focus on productivity, but on uh, consumption side as well? So is it a question of access, or is it a question of uh, information and affordability? I think it's a little bit of both. But there's also a huge question around um, what we refer to as informational asymmetries. Mm -hmm. Um, so people, I've been in, in, in Ethiopia, in the region uh, that produces the most amounts of fruits and vegetables, almost everything is exported out. And you see the kids, in, I had never seen that before, children in those communities with very severe forms of vitamin A deficiency, when their pumpkin's rotting in the field over there. And you ask the mother, why aren't you feeding the pumpkin and the papaya that's right there? Oh, that's not good for children. And so this is, these are the informational asymmetries as well. Same thing in almost every country. We were looking at Nigeria yesterday, um, uh, India before, every country. Uh, the top, um, the highest, in, even in the highest income quintile, 64% Indian uh, children are anemic. 26% Nigerian children are stunted. It's not about affordability, mm -hmm. it's about informational mm -hmm. asymmetry. So depending on who you're looking at, mm -hmm. uh, I think all of those things come into play. Good, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I want to invite the, anybody in the group to uh, prepare some co questions for any of the panelists. Um, before we do that, Joy, I want to re uh, return to your statement about this critical mass of, of, of having women in a certain position where they have this access. And, and Mira talked about it, I think, with an emphasis on nutrition. Um, and in the food security di uh, paradigm or discussion, and whether it's adequate and you need to have nutrition, you need to have other uh, aspects of it included, including, uh, I think what I'm hearing is a, a, an appeal to equity uh, as well. Um, is there a chance in your thinking that through emphasis on nutrition, on, on women in this critical mass of women and the position that they need to have access to production, means of production and markets, that we won't have to get to $9 billion. That part of the calculation is that with success early on that we start to change uh, the curb or the ascendancy of, of, of what we think of now as food security meeting and uh, needs of a population of 9 billion? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, I think one of our colleagues here has talked about the unmet need that we currently have, that is currently assessed at 222 million. Um, this is couples that uh, have an unmet need for, for family planning. And it does not mean that uh, if it's 222 uh, million couples, it does not mean that um, they, they, the unmet need is you know, you're going to reduce the population by 222 million. You're probably going to reduce the population by, you know, five or six or seven times that are, uh, you know, maybe 10 times that amount by, by, by making access to family planning commodities uh, to this population. And that is an unmet need, which is we, we currently calculate, which we know about. There is a lot that we do not know, particularly that we, we when you go to countries like Malawi, um, some of us may have visited Malawi. Um, it has one of a very, very aggressive uh, uh, women's health program. And one of the, the, the things that they are finding in that aggressive women's health program is that the, the majority of people who are delivering now are under the age of 25. And uh, most of the, the maternal mortality is children under the age of 20. In, in, in Malawi. So what does this tell you? If, if these uh, children delayed their pregnancies and if there was access to family planning commodities for all these women and they got the education, they, you, will, you will, in a country like Malawi where, where, where you have in the rural communities an average of uh, you know, four, five, you know, five, five to seven children, I think is the official average uh, fertility. You could, if you reduced it to two, or even to three. The impact on the stunting that uh, Mira talked about, the impact on the ability of these women to be able, as the primary caregivers in the country, in the in the in the in the household, to be able to use some of the money that they are earning to educate the the the, the two or three children that they have, their ability to 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 um. To, to increase the wealth of, of the family will just be phenomenal. So I think there is an obvious linkage. There is an obvious linkage between um, access to family planning, the knowledge that will enable uh, women to reduce stunting, and uh, and also access to means of, uh, of production, a clearly li linkage between that and the population growth. And it, this is clearly proven. I come from a country where we have demonstrated this conclusively. That's why I'm so absolutely convinced. When I was born, the average family size in Botswana was, a, was a six to seven children, six, seven, eight or more. I mean, my, my, most, uh, most uh, people in my mother's age group uh, have on, on average, you know, six to seven children. Her, her own mother had 12 children, live births, and she, she had 16 pregnancies. So, 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 and yet now, we, we are just above replacement level in Botswana. So, so and, and the, the, the average wealth has increased tremendously. Okay, we still have huge inequity in terms of um, the distribution of the wealth. But, but uh, and the levels of employment have, 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 have just, uh, you know, increased so, so tremendously. And access to education, everything, wealth, average wealth has increased tremendously. So I am absolutely convinced that it is possible for us as a global community to be under a uh, nine billion, and that we can have a, a population of maybe eight billion if we really, you know, put our minds to it and appreciate that uh, the current capacity of this planet does really does not allow us to go to ten billion. You know, the, 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 the direction each way. Joy, just say another word. Uh, what made in your mind, uh, or even on the expert level, what is it that contributed to Botswana's success in, in delivering that access? What were the, what was the delivery mechanism that was successful? Um, I think it's it's everything that the panelists here talked about. Education is absolutely important, and then access, because if 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 you just give a woman a, an education and you don't give them access, then they'll be part of the two hundred and twenty two. A million that we are talking about that wants access, you know, you know, desperately, but does not have it. If she just has education, so you need the education, you need the access to family planning commodities, and then you need the access to means of production, and you need to the extent that you can to shape the markets, make the market more favorable for 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 for, for, for women to participate in. In Botswana, we are still, uh, we are still. Um, 
fighting the battle for you know for food security because we we still have not won that that, that particular battle because they we have not used the innovation that uh, mira was talking about in in, in innovation and uh, the structural economic transformation that is included that is necessary in the agata and food production sector in order for us to to be able to transform that sector for for women to participate uh, more 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 productively in that particular sector so you need a combination of everything uh, Sally, if you want to comment on this, I, I also want to understand, you, uh, Joy and, and Mira both talked about uh, the accessibility, but I'm wondering what is the mechanism of delivery? Does technology play a role now in the future? I mean, we're not necessarily stuck with the same uh, conditions that we were in the last 20 years. What are the paradigm or game changers that, that we need to, to, to accomplish this kind of critical mass that Joy was talking about? Sure. I mean, I mean Joy, you basically said we need to induce a demographic transition, right? Like. Africa is probably the only continent that still hasn't really uh, accomplished the demographic transition. And when you look at the academic literature, it's pretty, I mean, there's even a theory of the dem demographic transition theory. And it's usually infant mortality begin to decline. And about seven to 10 years later, you start to see drops in fertility. So basically, the argument was if you really wanted to reduce uh, numbers of women per child, the best thing you could do is to reduce the amounts of kids that are not dying by the, you know, but before they become adults. So there's that signal, and it takes, there's a lag, there's a lag that before uh, that, hap that, that really uh, takes shape. And one of my good friends, Jane Otai, who works in Kibera, the biggest slum, uh, slum in, uh, in, in Africa, who works on family planning issues with, with women and providing them with access, which is absolutely critical. But she, one thing that really stuck in my head was some of the women that were still refusing, despite having free, anonymous, you know, uh, access to family planning, refusing to take it. And, and the story she related was one woman that said, the worst thing that can happen to me as a woman in my community is to be childless. It's just to be childless. That's like absolute disaster, not to, to grow old and not have any offspring. It's terrible in the eyes of my family. It's terrible in the eyes of my husband. So if I need to have five kids and ensure at least one of them survives, I'm going to have five kids. Mm -hmm. So if you put yourself in their shoes, you can completely understand why even though in some cases the family plan doesn't work at all. So she and you know, her conclusion is that we absolutely have to focus on reducing infant mortality. And if you really want to address the issue of infant mortality, you have to pass that malnutrition and nutrition. And obviously access to, to health, both for the mother and, and, for, um, and, and for the child. So yeah, um, and then just one, one last thing I wanted to, uh, to point out that I think it's actually, in Mali as well, our biggest food producing region has the worst outcomes in terms of malnutrition. It's, it's almost it's a paradox. Yeah. It's an absolute paradox. And uh, I know the World Bank has done quite a bit of research, and we haven't really talked about the, the global economy as a whole, yeah. but the cost of iron deficiency anemia, at least in Mali, was estimated at 4% of GDP per year, just lost, just simply due to iron deficiency anemia, which can be solved by adding some iron to rice or iron supplements simply because of, of that. So I think there's a lot of relatively cost-effective solutions that will have real impacts on people's well-beings uh -huh. and also have enormous benefits for society as a whole. And the question is, who should bear that cost? Is it the government? Is it the private sector? And I think that's where now we can really begin to move forward. Like, who should really take that responsibility to ensure that no kid struggles from the lack of, of iron or no mother during pregnancy is, is, is iron deficient? And, and, and what do you think? Okay. And wh wh where is the first step for you? I think I think the uh, I think the path really is for entrepreneurs to step up and the private sector to step up. It's um, the technology I think is, is there. If you look at rice, which was probably the one crop that was a bit difficult to uh, to fortify uh, mm -hmm. due to several factors. Because the other thing to be uh, the other thing we need to also focus on, and Jason may, uh, mentioned this, was the issue of waste and mostly post-harvest waste. Yeah. A lot of these foods need to be transformed. So when we think of markets, we're not only thinking of like farmers selling directly to consumers, but to buyers that will then transform the product, add value to, the, to those products. Mm -hmm. And in other words, these farmers need people to provide them with services. And that's something we're not, we're not seeing, or, the government, or it's been seen as the government's responsibility or NGO's responsibility, where it's actually a great opportunity if you're an entrepre entrepreneur to build you know, that network and that relationship, or understand the psychographics of that farmer or the farmer moving forward. And that could be your competitive advantage. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what we're, that's our strategy for our company is to really to be the farmer's best friend. And the technology is basically agnostic. It's really if you build those human relations with farmers, 
that will give you a competitive advantage in the future. So it's, the technology is there, but it's not, it's not really the, for our, in our view, the, the, key, the key component. Jason, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I mean, I think that uh, this discussion has added a lot of perspective on terms of the role of nutrition and women's rights or women's reproductive health and, and family planning. Um, but I also noticed, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but uh, that in our more international discussions on climate change and food security, that this part is the par part of the puzzle that sometimes is the hardest or missing in the discussion. In other words, the policy apparatus still seems siloed to me. It still seems as though climate change, food security, are starting to understand each other, uh, water security, some of the things around uh, uh, environmental intensification of land. But when you get then to the human component of, the, of, of the, the points that were being made here by the panel on nutrition and on access to markets and, and the, woman, the role of women in that, it seems like it breaks down. But maybe I'm wrong about that. But you're in a position to kind of see that. And I was curious what you would say about it. Well, let me kind of give a rambling answer because there's there's several points that I think that I think are relevant. Sorry. Um, so food waste. I mean, let's pick up on that. Uh, we waste one out of three calories today in virtually every country in the world. Uh, and if you look at that slightly differently, that means that of what we eat, we waste fifty percent. That's that's what's left that we waste. Now that 50%, that one out of three calories is, if if you believe the science, agriculture all in and including conversion of land, et cetera, is 30 to 35% of greenhouse gas emissions. That means that food waste equals 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions, just the waste. If agriculture uses 70% of all the water on the planet, which it does, then 23% of all the water on the planet is used to produce food that's wasted not fed to cows, not fed to cars, not used for anything, wasted. So there's synergies between these things. I mean, one of the best things we could do globally for making agriculture more sustainable and improving the lives of farmers is to create a price for carbon. Because soil carbon is arguably the best indicator of sustainable agriculture. We don't have a better indicator. If we're maintaining or increasing soil carbon, that is sustainable agriculture by definition. And it, and w what we've seen in Brazil and other tropical countries is if we can add half a percent of soil carbon, organic matter, if we can add half a percent, we can reduce input use by 10%. That's what it takes. So we begin to see synergies between these things, but we're n we don't have a policy framework that yet uh, reinforces that. But I'd, I'd like to, to go back because there's a kind of assumption here that I think we need to challenge. And the assumption is that we need to educate farmers and their children to be farmers. Nonsense. We need them to give the capacity to do whatever they want, not predict or predetermine what that result is going to be. I mean, I grew up in this country on less than a dollar a day. I've had thousands of people that have helped my career, but if any of them wanted me to be a small farmer, I wouldn't be here in front of you today. I'd be poor in Missouri living on food stamps. And so, we need to understand, let's not predict or predetermine the results we want. Let's create the conditions that allow people to change with the speed of life today, because the speed of life is changing very fast. So uh, for me, it's not about maintaining poverty, which is what a lot of the small farmer development programs are about. It's about eradicating it. And it's a fundamentally different strategy. Uh, and then just to put it, in a backdrop, you know, from an environmental point of view, from the ecosystem services that we need, not just for farming, but for life on the planet, if we need to double food availability by 2050 and we have a business as usual approach, does that mean we double the amount of land we use? There is no way we can do that. So we've got to intensify. We absolutely have to intensify. The question is how? And which systems can do it? Basically, all of them are going to have to, organic, you know fair trade, agroforestry, conventional, no-till, I mean, all of them literally are going to have to, to double down. So those are the kind of issues that I think right now we're at a very pivotal time. The speed of change is much faster than our response. And we haven't even begun to see climate change yet. Yeah. Let me just, final point sure. here. It took the UK 155 years in the Industrial Revolution to double GDP. 
that was, you know, nine million people at that point. It took China 12 years for more than a billion people to double GDP. China's doubling ended in 1995. 11 years later, we saw the impact of that doubling on price spikes in 2006. India doubled its GDP for 840 plus million, and that happened, completed in 2006. 11 years later is gonna be 2017. We haven't seen India's impacts hit the market yet. That's gonna happen. It's not gonna be the same as China. It's not, we can't predict that it's gonna be exactly the same, but it's, it's going to happen. The speed of change now on the planet is much faster than ever before, and we're solving this problem and the world has already moved on. We're trying to be perfect when directionally we need to be better. Uh, and, and there's just a kind of urgency that I think we're missing. Plus in, in the period 2010, 2011, China's economy, I would say is it, it really was China's economy more than anything else, was pulling the 100 other economies that were growing at 5% or more. Where was the global recession? US and Europe. It wasn't around the world. It wasn't everywhere. And so this kind of change is pulling other people out of poverty. You know, China lifted 400 million people out of poverty in that first 12-year uh, period and 200 million since. And the same thing is happening in other countries. That's a great thing. That's a phenomenal thing. But it has implications on how we use resources. Yeah, so it's, it's clear that, and I thank you for that, because I think that all of this discussion takes place in this global economic uh, condition that uh, is being pulled and pushed in, in many different ways, and none the least of which is what Jason just outlined here. Um, let me see if there's any questions from the audience. I just want to ask Clive one question here. Um, it's really for the whole group, but Clive, maybe you can say uh, the, the, the dynamic that does seem to be changing, at least in Sub-Saharan or Africa, is the demographic, the age of the uh, uh, demographic. And combining that with Salif's point about entrepreneurialism, it seems like there, there must be some optimism uh, in that dynamic. Do you see it or do you trade on it in your thinking? Yeah, I think I, I, I agree that there's um, a lot of hope in the way the dynamics, especially population dynamics are changing in Africa. A good example, I would talk of a country like Kenya, which had a, a total fertility rate of eight children per woman by 1979. But uh, right now, the fertility total fertility rate is 4.6 children per per woman. It's it's going down. It started at some point because of um, uh, investments in family planning and reproductive health, and uh, of course because of the uh, persistent growth over time. There is a youth bulge. Uh, um, uh, most of the populations in the region are predominantly young, which also is a big potential for uh, demographic dividend, which requires investments in uh, uh, in economic uh, reforms, in uh, creating jobs, employment, and investing in all the uh, social services. So it's a great thing that even policymakers in the region are seeing the links and are uh, I'm really trying to position family planning as an important uh, uh, factor for sustained uh, economic growth and development. Uh, a good example is what Joey mentioned in, uh, in Rwanda, where the president and all the government are very uh, straightforward and family planning is like a national campaign. And this has really uh, improved health outcomes. Women are more empowered. They, the services are there because there is a uh, priority within government and also donors to really invest in this. So it's a, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity within, uh, within the continent. Like uh, Salif mentioned, Africa is the only continent that has not really uh, appreciated the, the goods, uh, good things coming out of the demographic dividend. But the good news is that a number of countries are really uh, stepping forward and putting money policies and programs into action to reap the demographic dividend. Good. Thank you, Clyde. We have a question over here. We'll work our way across if we can. Yes. Uh, Please, sure. That would be probably better. Yeah, hi. Uh, um, uh, my name is Kwasi. Uh, I'm a land use planner here. And uh, thank you, David, and thank you all for th this presentation. I think there's something. Uh, we grasp what is going on cognizant of the fact of the huge population dynamics in uh, 
well, the best that I know in Africa. But there's something missing here, which I think Jason almost brought it up. That is talking about the overlapping conversion of land that is happening in most places in Africa. The geographical conflicts whereby agricultural land is being lost to mining, to so many areas. In most of the studies that we've done in Ghana, in the western part of Ghana, almost all the agriculture is almost totally lost because of mining. And uh, there's no answer. In some other places that we have looked at, what we notice is that most of these African countries, there's no national special land use policy. Mm. There's no national special land use policy. If there's anything like that and it's being enforced, these sort of problems would actually not happen at all. The other uh, point that I might want to tap your brains is uh, we notice the huge migration going to the cities. If you look at what is happening in most African countries, farming, which is being lost, uh, the young people are not farming. We all know. And the farmers are old. And uh, just who is going to farm in the next uh, century? Yeah, so these are things I might want you to bring it up in the overall uh, 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 things that we are discussing. Because recently, uh, if I may remember, uh, Nigeria, they had to bring in old farmers from Zimbabwe in one of the states, because nobody wants to be on the farm. As such. These are things that we want to bring up in our course of our discussion, and I appreciate your input. OK, yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I mean, there's kind of two questions there, one on, on, on really the lack or maybe the uh, lack of land use, use planning and land use policy on one hand, and then the question of kind of the urban-rural integration question or, or exodus. Uh, yes, Salif? Uh, that's great. Um, that, that was uh, really. Uh, fascinating comment, and uh, it's something we're trying. Uh, we're in talks right now with a major mining company in Mali right now, precisely because of this problem that, uh, uh, first of all, it, it raises expectations of communities when a new mine, um, a new mining company shows up. Yes, it does show up with a CSR program. It shows up with a commitment to build a health center, a road, a school, etc. But the results really are not are not being shown on the ground. You know, it looks great on YouTube, on Twitter, but when you go talk to young people in that community, they're it's, it's extremely angry. So we were able to convince uh, this particular mining company, one, not only to take agriculture almost as seriously as it's taken mining, the way it takes, the way it invests, the way it, it, it plans for its operation when it comes to mining, to think also about the agricultural land, because they get these massive blocks of 10,000, 50,000 square kilometers, which technically belongs to them or they leased it from the government for 50 years or for 99 years, you name it. So it's technically private property. So now this particular mining company, the pilot that we're establishing is we're going to begin with 50 hectares. But more important, not just bringing in tractors and bringing in experts from overseas, bringing in all the technology, but to actually build a school, an ag school or incubator from people in the community that are going to be trained for three years, the first year is like an apprentice program where they basically just learn the new tools, the new techniques, get exposed to some of these ideas. Because you're absolutely right. The young people don't think agriculture is sexy anymore. You go to rural areas, all you see is kids and old people. Because all the young people are gone. Cause I, and, and you mentioned, Jason, you, who would want to be a farmer right now in Mali when it's 45 degrees you know, in the sun? Who would want to be using you know, an axe and farming like they did a 1,000 years ago? Nobody. And you're losing a whole generation of that. So the the mining company's convinced, or it's at least it's it's um, it's willing to test it out. Is can we now create a whole new generation of farmers that are educated, even if they don't have formal training, but at least can go home and say, "Listen, I've I've taken I've had a a, a formation or a formation. I say I say in French, in in these new technologies. I use solar panel. Look, I have a cell phone. I could turn on my irrigation by sending an SMS. I mean, you only talk to an eighteen-year-old. He's absolutely fascinated." By these things, so I think there's a there's a huge, huge, huge potential uh, to combine some of the natural resources that people uh, that traditionally associate with Africa, which is what's underneath the ground, with what potentially can be grown ab above ground. And so I think that's really uh, we'll stay tuned. We'll hopefully, hopefully we can uh, you know be, be successful and that can be scaled up. Jason or anyone else want to respond to the question on land use? Well, I just think that that as resources. As our awareness of, of the finite nature of the planet and of resource base becomes clearer, then land is going to become more valuable, and water already is becoming more valuable. So we're, we're seeing more and more planning around this. 
uh, and and we'll we'll begin to plan it. I guess my question is, can these piecemeal efforts to plan at at ten thousand feet actually add up to something at the planetary level? Because what we're finding right now is that most governments are not actually yet engaged in this, and nobody's doing it at a planetary level. And so how do we manage the planet? And who's managing the planet? Right now, it's more the private sector than it is governments. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, my, my opinion, I mean, similar to, to, to that that has been made, is that the way global development is structured is that we are not actually focusing on management of our resources. We don't have any global development programs that focuses on management of any resource. We focus on the on, on management of uh, programs that are going to handle the resources. So I think it just it, we need a whole new way of thinking uh, globally. But it, it's a very good point, and I, I could not agree more. Okay, we'll go on our next question. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Sekero. I'm the president of a nonprofit organization called Hope for Tomorrow. I'm an African woman born and raised in Kenya. And uh, we focus on rural electrification and communication. As an African woman born and raised in Africa, I know in rural areas, that's why I'm focusing in rural areas. That's why we have women who know how to go to the farm. You don't, I don't have to do research to hold a hoe, to go and dig and to plant. Yeah. I don't have to be taught to sit in school or that rural woman. What the woman in the rural area needs is just an alternative, as Mr. Chesson said. Yesterday I spoke here, I said, we have so many organizations, family planning, nutrition, finance, and what. But what they don't do is they don't work with people like us who are global diaspora. I come from Kenya. They would come from here, go to my rural area where I come from. You are teaching a woman uh, one acre farm to give me seed to teach me how to go to the farm, and you left me here, making me understand what you want me to do. You just said educated farmers. No, Africans don't have to be. We grew up on the farm. We just need an alternative to make or fight poverty for nutrition. In Kenya, mangoes in Mombasa, they are following town, oranges, uh, all kind of food, pineapples. These are nutrition foods that could be manufactured and packaged. That's why we are focusing on power and communication and industrialization. All those fruits can be made into nutri nutrition for local consumption and export. But who is doing that? Who is giving the money? We don't know. We just hear about, we come here four, five days, we would be hearing all the stories. When we go, they forgot until the annual meeting, until the spring meeting. Where is the impact? So when I talk, Mr. Chesson, let's collaborate. You are a small organization. I'll never hear from him until annual meeting. Another company, another organization. So where are we? Okay. We just need an alternative for these women and especially the ones in rural areas, young people. People in, in Africa are using cell phones. Who taught them how to use? They can text. They can work with the television. They, can, they just need an alternative okay. education, basic things to move on and fight poverty. But I don't believe in that they, everybody has to be educated. Those young people, they are be becoming hacks. They are becoming Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab because of poverty. There is nobody to give them an alternative, a job creation or something they can do to make a living. So okay. we need to work together. How do we work together, like Mr. To Jason? Maybe How get our get panel resources? to respond. So that's my main aim. So it's not a matter of with the women uh, no, it's a good productive. Point. Family planning is there. Women are being have hurt. You don't have to have five children. If you have five children, what are you going to feed them? But if you, they hear, and that's why they are taking family planning prescription. Well, let's see if the panel can respond to your your very, very important point. I mean, we don't need a hundred or a thousand new NGOs. And the question is, uh, what are the other economic opportunities that impact on the very topics that you're talking about here today? I mean, obviously, there's a need for diversity in the economies, uh, and not all of it will be related to uh, kind of smallholder farming. Anybody want to respond? Well, I think one of the first steps for out of out of a uh, subsistence agriculture livelihood is processing a foot in and a foot out of, of agriculture. And that's where waste is very important. Waste from, as you mentioned, from 
uh, bananas, from pineapples, from mangoes. I mean, 90% of the mango crop in India and Bangladesh is wasted. Uh, even if we had a process, aseptic processing plants with kind of Tetra Pak type of packaging going in on trucks, we could process the waste where it is. We could process those crops before they're wasted. Uh, and in, and in, even instead of potentially paying farmers just cash for their crops, we could actually pay them in product that would have a shelf life that would feed them through the rest of the year so they'd have nutrients all year round. I mean, there, there are lots of things we could do to yeah. kind of bridge this to the next level, both of income, off-farm employment, and, and nutrition. But yeah. I think we, we need to get outside the box a little bit. And so there, there is an opportunity or a need for those secondary markets. Anybody else want to respond to that? Or to leave or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Jason said. Um, I don't think I've ever met a smallholder farmer or someone that wanted to stay small. They're, they're small because of circumstances, because they didn't, they didn't have the opportunity really uh, to get access to credit, to get access to the support that they needed to really kick on and expand their, um, uh, expand the production. Um, so for example, in, in Mali, we have some, you know, we have customary law, because that's the other big issue with land, when it comes to land rights, the regulation around land rights and land ownership. So it's definitely customary law where a village might have 100 hectares or 1,000 hectares. And most of it is just idle. Nobody's farming it. And it's because they just don't have the means to do it. But if you went and asked them for one dime, one dollar, they don't have it. But they're sitting, or they have enormous wealth creation capacity. And I think that's the key thing is yeah. to unlock those wealth creation capacities. And you know, to maybe kind of go on an op a positive note is if you look at some of the trends technologically, we're seeing two things. We're seeing increase in capability of some of these new technologies and decrease in cost. And I think this trend, this dynamic will continue. So the issue of solar panel, for example, a country like Mali where we have one of the highest solar radiance rates in the world, not harnessing solar or not really focusing on improving ba battery capacity to me is, is a travesty. But it will come. I'm, I'm optimistic it will come. And once you unlock that energy problem, then you can start building those factories <coughs> and installing that stuff. But that, I think that's maybe the call uh, to urgency, you know, with, with all the major universities, all the major folks, when we talk about food security more broadly, is don't just focus on the seeds and farming per se. There's so many aspects of the entire value chain. Of the food system, that, yeah. That can be uh, important. You can be an artist, you know, a marketer, a master communicator, and you can still contribute to food security because you're addressing some of the market issues or, or educating a potential um, customer in the future. Okay. So there's, there's really, we, can, we need to think much more creatively about it about the entire value chain. Okay, thank you. Say that. Mira? Uh, thank you. Um, so just to tie that back to the conversation we were having earlier around the demographic dividend, I think it's all about empowering people to realize whatever their dreams may be, to get out of poverty, to, to continue to remain a small farmer or become a big farmer or, or go to an urban area, whatever their dream might be. And, and a lot of that is is lies in the promise of the demographic dividend, and I purposely call it the promise of the demographic, because it could be a promise or a disaster. It could be a dividend or a disaster. And if there are three things that one can invest in to make sure it's a dividend rather than a disaster, one is obviously family planning, and we've heard quite a lot about that. The, the second is investments in health, so we can have that reduction in child mortality that um, Salif was talking about. A and a third is um, um, girls' education. If we can invest in these three things, um, we will achieve that. We need to achieve a rapid drop in fertility in order for countries to realize that demographic dividend. And if we don't invest in these things, uh, we will lose this opportunity. It's again a do it now or lose it forever well, sort we, of opportunity. Thank uh, we're you. out of time, but I, I do want to get one last question in because you've been so patient. For, yeah. I was yeah. hoping that one of my colleagues would address it. I'm a bit concerned right. because I'm an education buff about um, that's the comment that was made by my colleague and my sister about education. I just want to uh, to 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 clarify that uh, our definition of education is not a uh, just the formal sector education, going to school and having a university degree or having a, a, a high school as a diploma. It is about knowing how to use the, the, um, the means of production that are available to you, the information, the technology, in order to, for you to be able to, to maximize what you can get. 
So when we talk about education, if you have been taught a new technology or how to use a new system or how to access a market, that is ed the education we are talking about. We are not talking about going to a classroom. It includes everything. So I just wanted, uh, I'm, I'm a, I became a bit worried when people say, you know, we don't just need, I think we need education all the time. I'm still being educated even now. Uh, and I've been a vice president here. So, yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that because, okay. I, you know, I, I'm very passionate about it. Quickly, one last question, and then we'll close the, the panel. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Mandy Morgan. I work at the World Wildlife Fund. And thank you to all the panelists for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, we all know the benefits of a uh, the environmental and nutritional benefits of a plant-based diet. And I'm wondering if there are any movements, I've heard of one non-governmental organization that's doing this, but are there any movements to move away from the animal-based diet towards the plant-based diet? And if not, what do you see as the barriers to this type of shift? Thank you. Anybody on the panel? I think Jason probably can field this question. Is, is well, okay? I think, so, so let's be clear. Yeah. Today, animal-based, Proteins represent, in terms of calories, represent about 13.5% of all calories consumed by people. So we're still in a plant-based uh, diet right now. Uh, what we see globally is that every country that increases its uh, per capita GDP increases its consumption of animal protein. Uh, and it's different items that are consumed. It's dairy, it's eggs, it's chicken, it's fish, it's it's whatever, but it always increases it. So we haven't seen a move away. We've actually probably seen more. I think as, as we confront the finite planet thing, um, right now we're using 60% of all the land on the planet that we use to produce food to produce 1.3% of the calories in the form of beef. Going forward, that's not a very efficient conversion. Now that's maybe 3 4% of nutrients but it's still not a great exchange so can we cut that in half i don't think it's a question of moving away from it entirely because we're converting grass into something we can eat that's not a bad thing but we can can we take 30 percent of the land and produce twice as many calories or twice as much uh, protein as we currently do these are the kinds of things we're going to have to start doing more of or do we think that aquaculture is actually better than beef which incidentally Two years ago, aquaculture production on the planet surpassed beef production. There you go. Nobody knows it, but it's it's actually already happening. Yeah. But it's uh, still uh, animal protein. Topic for but a whole other, other panel and that I'd love to have. Uh, thank, if everyone could join me, please, in thanking our panel. That was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much.